just to situate what I'm doing here in my work and my current uh, book in progress is thinking about ambient music as a genre. So I know ambient can mean so many different things. And uh, when I'm thinking about the history of ambient music, I'm thinking about what is the history of this discursive framework for encountering and using music that we call ambient. And uh, I'll play you a sound clip that introduces uh, one such antecedent to this genre. space fans. <laughs> so this was a clip from the weekly radio program, Music from the Hearts of Space. This segment aired uh, on August 9th, 1979, at about 1 a.m. on Pacifico Radio, a public radio station serving the greater San Francisco Bay Area in Northern California. Um, you might recognize here the voice of Stephen Hill. Does anyone recognize this by any chance? Okay familiar. Um, I ask because Hill's program became nationally syndicated in the U.S. with the shortened title Hearts of Space through NPR's satellite network in 1983. That's National Public Radio. Airing with the tag Slow Music for Fast Times, Hearts of Space reached nearly 300 public radio stations around the U.S. at its peak popularity in the late 80s into the 90s. While Hill's program to this day airs weekly on over 100 terrestrial stations and an online streaming service, the program is best known for its role as a major force shaping and driving the atmospheric music boom of the late 20th century, as well as arguably the first and longest running ambient radio program in the world. Since the show's inception in October 1973, before New Age and ambient were coined as musical genres, Hill and his co-host Anna Turner or Timotheo and Animistic, as they called themselves on air in the 70s, presented an expansive cross-cultural, trans-historical, and trans-generic sonic vision. In its earliest years, Music from the Hearts of Space aired a mixture of space rock, progressive rock, sacred and classical musics from around the world, singer-songwriter folk, light jazz, minimalist, and electronic, mu electronic music. By 1983, they were calling this blend space music a label that cut across the ideologies, genealogies, and aesthetic conventions that later came to be associated with the new age and ambient genres. At the same time, the duo's space music concept anticipated and gave rise to the rapid codification and commodification of atmospheric music between the mid 70s and early 90s. Today, I'd like to explore some of the early years of Hearts of Space prior to its syndication from 1973 to 83 as a way of contemplating some of the cultural, ideological, and material conditions that propagated the popularization of atmospheric music, including ambient music. In January 2016, I had the privilege to spend a week with Hill and his wife Layla at their home in San Rafael, California. They're wonderful <coughs> people, uh, warm and inviting, and very talkative. And here I spent time reviewing the show's archives, including tapes, playlists, and ephemera. Uh, through these materials, I became interested in the cultural and intellectual environment that nurtured Hill and Turner's particular sensibility, namely the grassroots New Age culture of the California Bay in the 1970s and the associated New Consciousness movement. Hill and Turner's program, I will argue, deserves a prominent place in ambient music history despite its close association with New Age or New Consciousness culture. 
Although New Age music in the late 80s and 90s became one of ambient music's disavowed others, the other others being easy listening and music, of course, music from the Hearts of Space's first decade anticipated the terms by which ambient music later defined itself, putting forth exploratory, tasteful, artistic, evanescent musical atmospheres for stilling the mind and body and setting listeners adrift. So most of the information I'm covering today relates to Hill's experience. Turner left Hearts of Space in 1986 and passed away in 96 due to illness, so most of what I know comes from Hill. A little background on Hill, he grew up in New Jersey and Florida, but had it intended to make a career out of the radio hobby he picked up at age 10. He studied art history in college, then got his master's in architecture at UPenn. But architecture jobs proved scant in 1970, and so Hill decided to move to San Francisco. And when I asked him what brought him to San Francisco, he simply answered, the zeitgeist. So you probably know what he meant, right? I mean, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, following the, the psychedelic countercultural boom uh, in San Francisco, the epicenter of the American counterculture. Uh, and this is a movement in which, as the saying goes, the personal was political. Uh, in the countercultural imaginary, the individual transformation of consciousness combined with participation in local networks of cultural production and consumption formed a utopian political praxis for spreading holistic thought, ecological awareness, and pacifism on a global scale. As countercultural historian Fred Turner puts it, at this time, the liberation of the individual became an evolutionary imperative. While the most radical practitioners dropped out of society to live in communes, most individuals swept up by the zeitgeist liberated themselves through an arsenal of psychosomatic technologies, techniques, and media, such as newsletters, catalogs, and self-help books, to yoga and meditation and prayer, to marijuana and acid rock. Cultural historian Sam Beakley describes these mediated practices of self-discovery as techniques of loosening or getting loose. These are protocols for stilling the self, probing and transforming personal consciousness and harmonizing with one's surroundings. <clears throat> to aid in these therapeutic practices of introspection that emerged in the Bay Area and Berkeley especially, a new entrepreneurial techno culture in which Hill was interested in taking part. This grassroots community of hip boutiques and head shops, bookstores, health food stores, and co-ops started self-describing as new age around the turn of the 70s. Practitioners cultivated mediated practices of getting loose in utopian anticipation of a human evolution that adherents called the new consciousness or new age. Uh, many of these hubs of the new age grassroots culture would have also sold music uh, distributed through local independent labels or sometimes just handmade uh, tapes. And they also often hosted live concerts. And uh, here are just a few of these uh, locations in the San Francisco area. The notion that such decentralized media might infiltrate and populate mass culture was central to this way of thinking. The New Age community drew upon the cybernetic theories of Norbert Wiener, Buckminster Fuller, Marshall McLuhan, and Stuart Brand, who imagined the globe as an interconnected information system, and who championed automation and technology as a way of quickening mass enlightenment. This vision is best captured by Stuart Brand's Whole Earth Catalog of Technologies for a New Globally Interconnected Culture and the subsequent alternative technology movement championing accessible, small-scale, ecologically friendly technologies. Which takes us back to Stephen Hill being swept up by the zeitgeist, because when I asked if he could be more specific, Hill told me that he wanted to go where the Whole Earth Catalog emerged. Brand, according to Hill, was, quote, doing the same thing that I was doing, which was to underpin the cultural evolution with information and tools. Hill had the idea to use his technical know-how to assist in what he calls the Bay Area's free-form spiritual community, a network of syncretic groups and practices that largely adapted Buddhist and Hindu ideas and cultural forms to a Western context. During his first few years in the Bay, Hill was there to assist doing gurus needed PA systems, when singing swamis sought on-site field recordings, or when budding singer-songwriters wanted to cut a demo tape. In 1971, Hill began volunteering at KQED Public Radio, one of the country's first NPR affiliates, as a producer for a program led by integral yoga popularizer Sri Swami Sachidananda, who's 
depicted here. The following year, the following year, Hill helped start an interfaith talk show called Meeting of the Ways, featuring local spiritual groups and New Age intellectual leaders. After the show, Hill would play music into the wee hours of the night on a program he called The Adventure of Consciousness, named after a book on the teachings by Integral Yoga founder Sri Aurobindo. The show became the blueprint for music for the hearts of space. In October 1973, KQED changed its formatting structure and Hill moved to KPFA-FM, aka Pacifica Radio, where music director Charles Amerkanian gave him a late night slot on Sundays. And right here you can see a concert, concert poster from Hearts of Space's first month on the air where they broadcasted live from One World Family Natural Food Store. Uh, the, the store is, um, uh, was in the building that is now occupied by the famous Amoeba Records in Berkeley. So just as the alternative technology movement was taking off, Hill was interested in utilizing FM radio as an alternative medium for music. Pacifica had a decade prior given birth to the notion of freeform or progressive radio with John Lennon's Night Sounds. In the late 60s, freeform radio took off with the San Francisco counterculture. The Hearts of Space, unlike earlier freeform shows, had a concept, music that enabled relaxation, introspection, and personal development within a fast-paced urban environment. Anna Turner joined Hill in the summer of 1975. The two had met several years back at KQED, where Turner worked. They soon started coming up with various names for the type of music they played. Contemplative music, progressive infinite, ancient contemporary, inner space music. At the same time, their concept was based in a common new age metaphysical conception of music as a vibrational medium for personal transformation and spiritual growth. Spiritual aims, however, were rarely directly discussed as such on the show. Its vagueness as contemplative or inner space music made it appealing to New Agers while also opening it up to casual audiences. So I got a sense of the musical content of these early shows through Hill's notebooks from the time that you see here. Uh, here he kept rigorous program playlists and notes, as well as inspirational quotes and graphic prints. And it's hard to boil the uh, boil down the musical content of this show, but that's just what I'm going to try to do for the next couple of minutes because I wanted to share some of the music that made a big impression on Hill and Turner during his early years. Records and artists that got multiple spins on Hearts of Space during the 1970s. I'll start with arguably the first New Age records, uh, which may alternatively be called contemplative jazz. This is Tony Scott's Music for Zen Meditation, which I'll play a clip of in a second, and also Paul Horn's Inside the Taj Mahal. Both of these were released in 1968. singer-songwriter albums and tracks, such as by Judy Sill, Bruce Coburn, Kay Gardner, and Buffy St. Marie. I'll play a bit of Judy Sill. Asian and Asian-influenced classical music, rock and devotional chant, such as by Ali Akbar Khan, Bhagavan Das, and the Far East Family Band. Here's Bhagavan Das. synth music, such as by Mike Oldfield, Van Gelis, Tomita, Yasos, and Stephen Halpern. I'll play some Yasos. Mm 
And uh, I believe all these albums that I've just displayed were released uh, prior to Eno's music for airports and the uh, announcement of ambient music. But as we get into the late 70s, we start hearing a lot more minimalism, and I'm including Brian Eno under this category, as well as Terry Riley and Jordan De La Sierra, um, which I'll play right now. This wouldn't be complete without some cosmic rock, such as Tangerine Dream, Klaus Schulze, and Manuel Goetzschein. Uh, this clip by Manuel Goetzschein was used as the show's theme music. So when Hill and I spoke recently, he spelled out some shared characteristics of most music he plays. It often has a slow tempo. It creates or simulates environments. It defines space with reverb and echo. It produces rich resonance, and it involves repetitive patterns. This shared sonic profile of Hill and Turner's space music was meant to override distinctions of genre, geography, and history. Hill and Turner's space music concept and aesthetic provided a consistent musical vision that made room for New Age's alternative culture on an increasingly commodified radio dial. By the time Hearts of Space arrived in 1973, FM was becoming big business. This was, was the time of format explosion and market segmentation on the FM dial. Progressive radio and album-oriented rock were beginning to supersede freeform, balancing commercialism with hip credibility. But Hill and Turner's careful programming withstood the demolition of freeform on the FM dial. While their selections were modern and eclectic, their program structure indirectly borrowed from the beautiful music format that proved successful with older audiences from the late 60s through the 70s. Beautiful music stations played light instrumental tunes, think Percy Faith or Montevani. And uh, programmers aimed to create a matched flow with little variation in mood and tempo and minimal DJ announcements. Hill and Turner, despite their stylistic omnivorousness, likewise aimed to create experiences of flow for listeners through minimal announcements and matched moods, while their timely selections made the show more appealing for a younger audience. Hill has described this flow to me as a process of taking listeners into the deep zone of contemplation, what he calls an adjacent state of consciousness that heightens concentration and creativity. Hill and Turner would begin this flow by matching the local environment's mood and then modulating it. As Turner once wrote, quote, what we do on Music from the Hearts of Space is to choose a piece to begin the program that feels like the night, usually reflective of it, there's sometimes a harmonic and sometimes another note entirely that makes a chord with it. And then we move as it moves, staying on the edge of the moment, listening, waiting, responding, initiating. Hearts of Space's playlists normally began with somewhat more intense sounds, often cosmic rock, and gradually eased over the first hour into softer sounds and textures, soft jazz, classical music, and minimalism. This was a trajectory of retreat from the realm of social participation signified by rock into a calm, reflective, and emotionally sensitive deep zone. In early years, Hill and Turner thematized space music's distance from the social through sonic depictions of nature. Music often overlapped with ocean sounds, bird song, wolves howling, crickets, wind chimes, and wind harp. Around 1978, these nature sounds were gradually replaced by the motif of outer space, or what Hill liked to call the infinite void. Uh, this was emphasized through electronic and otherworldly sounds. The thematic of outer space allowed Hill and Turner to present their sounds as futuristic and adventurous, indexing the global space and universalism of their musical selections, while also collapsing the distinction between outer and inner space exploration in listening. Of course, this would become a motif that links psychedelic culture to ambient music. 
Musical adventurousness was a key for Hill. A 1982 notebook shows Hill assessing the common denominator of the hearts of space experience as soothing and exploratory, not soothing and saccharine. Soothing without being endlessly vacuous, the music should create listening experiences that, quote, take people into new spaces. But New Age music and Hearts of Space did nonetheless gain a reputation for vacuousness, and I'll illustrate this with a clip uh, from 1991, uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000. Oh, hi, you crow. Oh, hi, what's doing? Oh, we were just inspired by the cool New Age music of this movie, so we decided to uh, use the wall of keyboards to make our own great new New Age music. You want to help? Sure, uh, what can I do? Well, I can teach you how to play the keyboards. Will it take long? No, of course not. Come on over here. Here, check this out. Okay, put your hand, come on, put your hand over here. Okay. Put your finger down. See? Like that? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, you got, you're playing a New Age chord now, okay? Just like Yanni. All right, now, put another finger down. There. Okay. okay. Now you're playing the Yanni. Like, now hold it down for an hour. Yeah. Now hold it down until you get a record contract from Wyndham Hill. Oh, okay, cool. Servo, check it out. It's my new New Age Yanni lick. Uh, Joel, hold down my new New okay. Age Yanni lick. I gotta put my sandwich okay. down. This music's kind of dull, isn't it? Yeah, but it's a good way to make a lot of money without a big initial investment. <laughs> And now, music from some guys in space. Tonight on music from some guys in space, more fine new New Age music and sounds from super progressive Bay Area New Age keyboardist, Joel Robinson. Joel will be accompanied on the wall of keyboards by veteran minimalist, Crow T. Robux. We invite you to sit back and enjoy more repetitive New Age music as we cruise the space race. Come along, fellow travelers and enjoy music from some guys in space. <laughs> so good. Uh, so, of course, this is spoofing New Age music as making an easy dime. And by the time this aired in 1991, New Age was no longer a niche market or a grassroots movement. It was a lucrative market, heavily and successfully commodified by the mainstream record industry in the United States. Hearts of Space, having started on NPR in 1983, was instrumental in the rapid mainstreaming of atmospheric music as New Age. Through its associations with the New Age, it gained a bit of a bad reputation among rock and classical music aficionados. But a closer examination of Hearts of Space and its history reveals that the New Age movement was not all healing crystals, vibrating chakras, and pyramidology. Much was in fact aesthetically and intellectually exploratory, expressively rich and eclectic, and not too distant from the contemporaneous pluralism of the secular avant-garde. For this reason, I'd like to suggest that Hearts of Space poses a challenge to ambient music historiography, which is generally cleaved to Brian Eno's definition of ambient music as an experimental anti-music. Ambient music, first proposed as such in 1978, broke off from New Age as a distinct genre in the early 1990s as electronic dance music DJs and producers saw Eno's idea as an artistically independent alternative to a mainstreamed New Age. The moody ambivalence and unconventional sound world explorations of Eno's music, as well as his self-proclaimed avant-garde heritage, helped maintain a taste-based appeal for the hip, highbrow, intellectual, and cultural omnivore. But Timotheo, Animistic, and their fellow travelers were no stranger to atmospheric music that enhanced environments, retained a sense of doubt, and induced calm in a space to think. Indeed, like Eno, Hill and Turner fashioned Hearts of Space as a hip, tasteful alternative to easy listening or beautiful music. Hearts of Space also prefigured Eno's conception of ambient music as a way to take listeners into new, unexpected sound worlds embracing the futuristic possibilities of electronic sound to express complex dimensions of human feeling and being. And while Hill and Turner frequently dabbled in the uncomplicated tranquility and uplift of New Age music that ambient aficionados would later spurn, they also incorporated impersonal and even melancholy drone and repetition-based music into their aesthetic. Music from the Hearts of Space hence calls on us to reconsider ambient music within the context of a broader commodification of electronic technologies of droning and repetitive sound as a means of loosening the body and stilling the mind, a movement that Hearts of Space helped set in motion in the early 1970s. With this in mind, it's not hard to imagine an alternative, enoless history of ambient music in which Hill and Turner's space music inspires record producers 
composers and listeners to follow their drift away from New Age culture and into the infinite void. I am still in the middle of research and writing for this uh, chapter, so I'm really looking forward to your feedback. Thank you.